Aeneid, Book Three. After the gods saw fit to overthrow the power of Asia and Priam's guiltless race, after proud Ilium fell and Neptune's Troy lay smoking on the ground, we were driven by signs from heaven to seek another home on far desolate shores. We built a fleet close to Antandros and the mountains of Phrygian Ida. There, with no idea of our destiny, we mustered our men, and when summer came, my father and Chises ordered us to spread our sails to fate. With tears in my eyes I left my native shores and harbors and the plains where once was Troy. An exile I took to the sea with my men, my son, and the great gods of my country and home. There lies at a distance a land near to Mars. Its wide fields, once ruled by Lycurgus, are tilled by Thracians, old allies of Troy, while fortune still smiled. There I sailed and on its curving shore began to build, under adverse auspices, my first city and named it after myself, Aeneade. I was bringing offerings to Venus and the gods, who bless new beginnings, and I was preparing to slaughter a sleek bull to the Lord of Heaven there on the shore. Nearby was a mound, its summit crowned with cornel shrubs and bristling myrtle. I went over to it and bent down to pull some greenery from the soil to deck the altars, when I witnessed an awful portent. The first bush that I uprooted oozed drops of black blood that clotted on the ground. A cold horror numbed my limbs, and icy fear coursed through my veins. Still, I pulled up another sapling, trying to understand the mystery within. This one bled, too. Greatly troubled, I prayed to the nymphs and Father Mars, Lord of Thracian fields, to lighten this omen and turn it to good. But when I pulled, with greater effort, upon a third branch, struggling on my knees in the sand, should I speak or be silent, I heard a groan from deep within the mound, a piteous voice that sighed on the air. Why are you rending my flesh, Aeneas? Spare a buried man. Do not commit this sacrilege. I am no stranger to you, but Trojan born. Nor is it wood and bark that wells with blood. Flee this savage land, this avaricious coast. For I am Polydorus, transfixed by spears and overgrown with an iron crop of sprouted blades. Fear now pushed me to the breaking point. My hair stood on end. My voice choked. This Polydorus had been sent by Priam with a fortune in gold to be reared by the king of Thrace. This was when Priam had lost all hope that this besieged city could be saved by arms. But the Thracian, seeing that Troy's power was broken, joined forces with victorious Agamemnon and broke all faith. He cut down Polydorus and seized the treasure. O oh, cursed lust for gold, to what do you not drive the human heart? When the fear had ebbed from my bones, I reported these portents to the elders, my father especially, and sought their judgment. They were of one mind, to quit this accursed land where hospitality had been desecrated, and sail with the wind. We held a funeral for Polydorus, heaping the mound high with earth and erecting to his shade somber altars dark with cypress and deep purple ribbons. The Trojan women stood round them, her hair unbound in ceremony, while we offered cups foaming with warm milk and bowls brimming with sacrificial blood. So we interred his spirit and called his name for the very last time. As soon as we had good sailing weather and a whispering southerly call, called us to sea, the crew launched the ships out from shore. We watched the cities and lands fade in the distance. In the middle of the sea lies a hallowed island, dear to the Nereids and Aegean Neptune, the archer god, loyal to the isle of his birth, stopped its wanderings and moored it in place close to Mykonos and Gyros, the island Delos, secure at last from the winds. I pulled in there, and the island welcomed our wearied men in its peaceful haven. On shore we paid homage to Apollo's city, and Aeneas, both king and priest of Phoebus, ran up to meet us, his brows bound with fillets and sacred laurel. He recognized Anchises as an old friend, and clasping our hands in welcome, led us under his roof. I began to pray in the god's ancient stone temple. 
grant us god of thimbra a home of our own grant our weary band walls a nation a city that will endure preserve a second troy for the remnant left alive by the greeks and merciless achilles whom shall we follow where shall we go where settle down give us an omen father slip into our hearts these words were barely out when it seemed everything trembled the door the god's laurel the whole mountain shook and the holy tripod bellowed loud as the shrine was laid open we fell to the ground and a voice filled our ears enduring sons of dardanus the land that bore you from eternal stock will welcome you back to her fruitful bosom seek your ancient mother from that land the house of aeneas will rule the world his sons sons and their sons thereafter thus apollo and amid tumultuous joy everyone asked to what land what city does phoebus mean we should finally return then my father, searching old memories, said, Listen, my lords, and learn what to hope for. Crete, the island of great Jupiter, lies in the middle of the sea. Mount Ida is there, and there, too, is the cradle of our race. Men live in a hundred cities there, the realm most rich from which Teucer came, our earliest ancestor. If I remember rightly, he sailed from Crete to our Rochian shores and chose a site for his kingdom. Ilium and high Pergamum had not yet been built. Men lived in the lowlands, and from Crete came the great mother Sibyl, the Cor Corabent symbols, our own wooded Mount Ida, the mysteries silence, and the lions yoked to Sibyl's chariot. We must follow where the god leads, appease the winds, and sail for Gnosis. It is not a far run. If Jupiter is with us, the third dawn will anchor us off Cretan shores. And Chises spoke and offered due sacrifice, a bull to Neptune and to you, Apollo, a black sheep to the storms, a white to the zephyrs. A rumor reached us that Idomeneus, the Cretan hero, had gone into exile, that the island was deserted, our enemy gone, and the houses abandoned and empty. We left Ortygia and flew over the sea, past Naxos, ridged with Bacchic revels, past green Donysa and Illyros, past gleaming Peros and the Cyclades, threading the straits between the islands. The seamen outdid each other, chanting, On to Crete, the land of our fathers! And a following wind pushed us along until we glided up to the ancient shores the Curates once haunted. And so I began to build my city. I called it Pergamum, and urged my people who loved the old name to cherish their homes and raise the citadel high with buildings. Our ships were just dry, drawn up on the beach, our youth beginning their families and farms, and I was busy making laws and parceling land when suddenly heaven's air turned foul with pestilential, and we were afflicted with a wretched plague, a season of death that spread even to our crops, our people lost their sweet lives or dragged their bodies around like corpses. Then Sirius scorched our sterile fields. The grass withered and the sickly crop denied us sustenance. My father urged us to recross the sea and asked Delian Apollo what end he might put to our weary fate, where we might seek aid in our distress, where to bend our course. It was night, and all living things slept. When the sacred images of the gods, the Phrygian penates, I took with me out of burning Troy, seemed to stand before my sleeping eyes, clear in the moonlight that flooded through the latticed windows, and with these words they dispelled my cares. What Apollo would tell you on Ortygia he tells you now, sending us unbidden to your very door. We followed you, followed your arms when Ilium was burned. Under you we traverse the swelling sea, and we will exalt your coming descendants to heaven's stars, and give to their city empire over all. Prepare great walls for the great, and do not shirk exile's long toil. You must change your home. These are not your shores. Nellian Apollo counseled. Not on Crete did he bid you settle. There is a place the Greeks call Hesperia, an ancient land, strong in arms and rich of soil. Onotrians once lived there. 
Their descendants now have named it after their leader, Italy. This is our true home. Here Dardanus was born, the father of our race, and his brother Iasius. Arise then, be glad, and bring these tidings, true beyond doubt, to your aged father. Seek Corythus, the land of Ausonia. Jupiter denies you the dictate of evils. Awed by this vision and the voice of the gods, it was not just a dream. I saw them clearly, their veiled heads and living faces, and a cold sweat poured down my body. I leapt out of bed, lifted both palms to heaven, and with a prayer to the gods made pure offerings upon my hearth. This rite completed, I rose with joy and told my father all that had happened. He acknowledged our twofold lineage and his confusion about our ancestry in two ancient lands. My son, steeled by Ilium's fate, it was Cassandra, Cassandra alone, who foretold to me our race's destiny, often naming Hesperia, naming Italy. But who would believe that Teucrians would come to Hesperia's shores? Who would be moved by Cassandra's prophecies? Let us yield to Apollo and pursue the better course. My father finished, and we all cheered. We abandoned this home, too, and leaving a few behind, we spread our sails and raced our hollow keels over the barren sea. When our ships were sailing out on deep water with no land in sight but only sea and sky, a brooding thunderhead settled in above us, bringing dark squalls to the shuddering waves. Huge seas rolled under the winds, heaving us all over the swirling abyss. Dark clouds shrouded the day and foggy night blotted out the sky while jagged lightning split the air again and again. We were thrown far off course, wandering the blind waves. Even Palinurus could not tell day from night or remember our heading. Three sunless days we drifted the misty sea, three starless nights. On the fourth day we raised land at last and saw mountains in the distance and curling smoke. Down came the sails and we manned the oars, churning the blue sea water into foam. Delivered from the sea, I first made shore in the Strophides, the Greek name given to the islands set in the Ionian Sea, which dark Seleno and the other harpies made their home after they fled in fear from the tables they kept in Phineas's palace. No monster, no curse, no plague more grim ever raised itself from the water of Styx. These birds have maiden faces. They drop foulest excrement. Their hands are claws, and their faces are pale with hunger. When we entered the harbor, we saw sleek cattle, scattered over the plains and flocks of goats unattended in the meadows swords drawn we rushed upon them calling the gods and jove himself to share the bounty then we built couches on the curved shore and began to feast but suddenly the harpies swooped down from the mountains beating their clanging wings and plundered our feast fouling every dish with their filthy touch and from the loathsome stench came hideous screams we set up the tables again, this time under an overhanging rock deep in a hollow, and relit the altar fires, and again they came from their hidden lair, a clamorous flock, circling above their prey with taloned feet. And then they polluted the feast with their maws. I ordered my men to take up arms and wage war against these dread creatures. We hid our swords in the long grass and concealed our shields. When they swooped down, screeching along the shore, Mycenas gave the signal from his high lookout, sounding his brass horn, and my men charged into strange combat, determined to despoil those filthy birds of the sea. But their feathers felt nothing. They could not be wounded, and they soared to the sky, leaving their prey half-eaten and foul. Only one, Seleno, a bird of ill omen, perched high on a cliff and spoke into prophetic speech. and driving us from our ancestral land, mark my words well. What the mighty Father Almighty told to Apollo and Phoebus Apollo to me, I first of the Furies revealed now to you. You are sailing the seas to reach Italy, and so you shall, and enter her harbors, but you shall not surround your city with walls until terrible hunger, and the way you wronged us drives you to chew and swallow her tables. Seleno spoke and then winged her way back to the forest. My men felt their blood turn icy with fear. Their spirits fell, and they pleaded with me to sue for peace, resort to vows and prayers rather than arms, whether these were goddesses or hellish birds. Father Anchises, with hands outstretched, called from the beach upon the great gods with proclamations of due sacrifice. 
Gods, stop their threats. Gods, avert harm. Save the pious, O gracious ones. And he ordered the stern cables torn from the shore and the rigging uncoiled. A strong southerly stretched the sails and we escaped on sea surge, where wind and pilot called our course. Wooded Zacynthus appeared in mid-sea. Then Dulicrium, Same, and craggy Neritis. We passed Ithaca's cliffs, the realm of Laertes, and cursed the island that nursed Ulysses. Leocates' storm-whipped peak soon came into view, and Apollo's temple, dreaded by sailors, weary, we sailed up to the little town and cast anchor. Our sterns fringed the shore. Safe on land we never hoped to gain, we purified ourselves with rites of Job, and made the altars blaze with sacrifices. Then we thronged the shore for Trojan games. My men, stripped and oiled, competed in their age-old wrestling matches, glad to have slipped past so many Greek towns and still be on their journey. Time went by, the sun rolled through the year's great cycle, and winter roughened the sea with icy winds. I fixed a bronze shield once borne by Abbas to the doorpost and inscribed this verse. These arms Aeneas dedicates from victorious Greeks. Then I gave the order to man the benches and pull out from the harbor. The crews outdid each other, sweeping the sea with oars. In no time we dropped the peaks of Phaeacia, grazed the shores of Epirus, and entered the Caonian port of towering Buthrotum. There we heard the incredible report that Priam's son Helenus ruled over Greek cities, having won the bride and kingdom of Pyrrhus, son of Achilles, and that Andromache again had passed to a Trojan husband. I was amazed and burned with desire to question him about this strange turn of events. I was making my way up from the harbor just when it, as it happened, Andromache was offering a ritual feast for the dead in a grove outside the city, beside the waters of a pretend Simois, pouring libations to the ashes of Hector, and calling his ghost to the empty mound of green turf, hallowed with twin altars and with her tears. She saw me coming, saw the Trojan arms, and could not believe her eyes. She stiffened, the warmth left her body, and she fainted. After a long time, she gasped out these words. Is the face I see real? Are you a true messenger, goddess-born? Are you alive? Or if the light has left you, where is Hector? She spoke and poured forth her tears, filling the place with her cries. So frantic, I was scarcely able to reach her with my few stammered words. Yes, I am alive through all my trials. You can believe what you see is true. Oh, what has happened to you since you lost your noble husband? What fortune could be worthy of you? Hector's Andromache, are you still married to Pyrrhus? Eyes downcast, Andromache lowered her voice and said, Priam's virgin daughter, Polyxena, was most fortunate of all, condemned to die at an enemy's tomb beneath Troy's walls, and never a slave in a conqueror's bed. We, our city burnt, were taken overseas and bore the disdainful pride of Achilles' son, giving birth in slavery. Later, he courted Leda's Hermione and a Spartan marriage and transferred me to Helenus, a slave to a slave. Orestes, inflamed with jealousy over his stolen bride and hounded by the Furies, caught Pyrrhus off guard and killed him at his father's altar. Helenus inherited part of Pyrrhus's realm and called it Caonia after Caon of Troy and built upon its hill a Pergamum, this Iliadic citadel. But you, what winds drove you on your fated course? What god has pushed you to our shores all unaware? And what about your boy Ascanius? Is he alive and breathing heaven's air? Even in Troy he still does he miss his lost mother? Do his father Aeneas and his uncle Hector inspire him to ancestral valor? These words poured out of her as she wept, and she was raising a futile lament when the hero Helenus, Priam's son, came from the city with a great company. He recognized us as kin and led us joyfully to the city's gates, yet weeping profusely at every word. As I advanced, I recognized a little Troy, a Pergamum, modeled on the Great One, a dry creek named after the Xanthus, and I embraced another Saiyan gate. My fellow Teucrians enjoyed the friendly city as much as I did. The king welcomed them in a broad colonnade, and they poured libations in the center of a great hall, holding their wine bowls as the feast was served on platters of gold. Day followed day, the breeze called the sails, and I, a strong southerly 
bellied the canvas, I approached the seer and made this request. Helenus, son of Troy, you speak for the gods. You know the will of Clarion Apollo, his tripod and laurel, and you know the stars, the sounds of birds and birds on the wing. All the omens concerning my journey have been favorable. All the oracles have counseled me to make for Italy and distant lands. Only the harpy Seleno has prophesied a portent, horrible to speak of, and threatened wrath and famine. Tell me now yourself, what are the main perils I must shun, and how may I overcome my trials? At this, Helenus first offered sacrifice, prayed for grace, and unbound his sacred brow. Then he led me by the hand to the gates of your temple, Apollo, my mind soaring with your presence, and prophesied. Goddess born, it is clear that your journey over the deep is sanctioned on high, for so the Lord of the gods has ordained, and so the wheel of destiny turns. I will therefore unfold for you a few things out of many, so you may more safely traverse the welcoming oceans and find heaven in Ausonia. The fates forbid Hellenists to know more, and Saturnian Juno censors my speech. First, the Italy that you unknowing think is near, and whose ports you are preparing to enter as if they were close, can only be reached along long coastlines and a long pathless path. You must first bend your oar in Sicily's waves and sail your ships in the Ausonian Sea, past the netherworld lakes and Circe's Isle, before founding your city in a land secure. I will now list signs for you to remember. In great distress you will find a huge sow lying under oaks near a hidden stream, with a litter of thirty, a white sow lying on the ground nursing white young. That shall be the site of your city and a sure rest from all your labors. Have no fear of gnawing your tables. The fates will find a way. Apollo will come. Avoid the near coast of Italy, washed by our sea. All of the towns are held by evil Greeks. The Norician Locri have built a city there. Cretan Idomeneus has occupied the Salentine Plains. The famous town of Philoctetes is there, little Petelia defended by her walls. But when your ships have crossed the high seas and stand moored, and you have built altars and fulfill vows on the shore, veil your hair with a purple robe so that no hostile face may appear in the fires and spoil the omens. But both you, yourself, and your men should hold to this manner of sacrifice. Let your children and theirs after remain pure in religion. When you leave and the wind has borne you to the coast of Sicily and the Straits of Pelorus begin to widen, make for land on the left and seas on the left in a long circuit round. Shun the shore and water on the right. These lands, they say, broke apart from each other long ago in a catastrophic upheaval. The ages can bring titanic changes. When the two countries were a continuous whole, the sea surged between, cutting off Sicily from Hesperia, and in a seething channel washed fields and cities on separate coasts. Scylla lurks on the right shore, and on the left, insatiable Charybdis. At the bottom of her swirling abyss, she sucks down tons of salt water in three gulps, then spews all of it up again, spraying the stars. Scylla, though, lies in her cave's dark gloom, extruding neck and jaws, and dragging ships onto her rocks. She looks human above, a beautiful woman down to her loins. Below, she is a scaly monster, joining a belly of wolves to dolphins' flukes. Better to round Pachinus slowly, make the turn at this promontory, and double back to complete the long lap, then even to glimpse Scylla's hideous form in her vast cavern, or to come within sight of the rocks that echo with her cyan hounds. And this above all, if Helen possesses any foresight, if I have as a seer any claim to belief, if Phoebus Apollo fills my soul with his truth, this one thing, goddess born, this one thing before all, I will foretell and repeat again and again. Worship Juno. Pray to her first. Joyfully chant vows to Juno. Shower her majesty with suppliant gifts and win her grace. At last, you will leave Sicily behind and be sent to the shores of Italy. When you come to Cume, its mystic lakes, and the woods of Avernus, you will meet a prophetess who in her frenzy chants the future and commits it to leaves with marks and signs. Whatever verses the virgin priestess scratches on leaves, she arranges in order and stores in her cave. There they remain in their numbered ranks. But if the door is opened and a light breeze disturbs the soft leaves and scatters them, she does not bother to gather them up as they fly through the cave, does not care to arrange them again and order the verse. And so those who inquired 
receive no advice and learn to hate the Sibyl and her shrine. Here you must spare no expense of time. Though your men complain and your journey calls and you have the chance to fill your sails with wind, you must visit the prophetess and plead with her to open her lips and prophesy in person. She will unfold for you Italy's nations, the wars to come, how to flee some toils and how to face others. Venerated, she will also grant you a favorable voyage. This counsel you are allowed to hear from my lips. Go and by your deeds lift Troy to the stars." Helenus finished his kindly advice and then ordered that gifts of heavy gold and sawn ivory be brought to our ships, and he himself stowed in our hulls massive silver and cauldrons from Dodona, a coat of golden mail and a superb helmet crested with plumes, arms of Pyrrhus himself. There were gifts, too, for my father and horses, and pilots to guide us, extra oarsmen and gear for my crews. Meanwhile, Anchises ordered the ships rigged with sails so we could catch the wind, and Helenus addressed him with deep respect. Anchises, worthy of wedlock with Venus, cherished by the gods, twice rescued from Troy, before you lies Ausonia, sail to seize it. Yet you must drift past this shore. Far is it, is that part of Italy promised by Phoebus Apollo. Go forth, blessed by the love of a pious son. My long speech delays the rising wind." Andromache, too, sad at this last parting, brought robes embroidered with woven gold, and for Ascanius, a Phrygian cloak, and paid him more honor, loading him with gifts from her loom, saying, Take these also, the work of my hands, child, and let them remind you of the enduring love of Andromache, the wife of Hector. Take these last gifts of your people, you the sole surviving image of my Astyanax. He was just like you in his eyes, his hands, the expression on his face. He would be the same age as you are now, a growing boy. Tears welled up as I said my goodbyes. Live happily. Your destiny is complete. We are still called from one fate to another. Your rest is won. You have no seas to plow, no quest for ever receding Ausonian fields. Before your eyes is an image of the Xanthus and a Troy that your own hands have built under better auspices. I hope and pray, and less vulnerable to the Greeks, if I ever enter the Tiber and its valley, and look upon walls granted to my race, we will have sister cities and be allies, Hesperia allied to Epirus, with the same Dardanus as ancestor, and the same tragic past. We will make them one Troy in spirit, and may it pass into the care of our children's children. We sailed past the near Chironian cliffs, along the shortest sea lanes to Italy. Evening fell and the hills grew dark. We allotted the next day's rowers and spread out on the dry sand for refreshment and rest. Sleep flowed through our bodies like a river. Night, driven by the hours, was just half through when Palinurus woke. He rose and tested the winds, listening, his eyes scanning all the stars, gliding in the sky. Arcturus, the rainy Hyades, and the two bears and Orion, armored in gold, he saw their steady light in the clear air and gave a piercing signal from his ship. We broke camp quickly and headed out, spreading our sails. Soon the stars faded in the rose light of dawn, and we saw dim on the horizon the hills of Italy. Italy! Achates was the first to call, and all the crews cheered, Italy! Italy! Father Anchises wreathed a great bowl, filled it with wine, and called to the gods from his ship's high stern. Lord of sea and earth and storm, O oh gods, make easy our way with wind at our backs. The winds he prayed for freshened. A haven opened before us, and a temple of Minerva appeared on the heights. The crews furled sail and turned the prows shoreward. The harbor curved like a bow away from the eastern surge, hidden behind rocky breakwaters that foamed with salt spray. Towering cliffs led down two craggy arms, and the temple retreated between them back from the shore. I saw there our first omen, four snow-white horses grazing on the plain, and Father Anchises, War! You bring us war, O promised land. Horses are armed for war, and yet horses sometimes are reined in concord. There is still hope for peace. Then he prayed to the holy power of the warrior goddess, Pallas, who first welcomed our cheers, veiling our heads with Phrygian robes before her altar, and remembering Helenus's tense commands, we offered the prescribed sacrifice to our guide Juno. 
Our devotions done, we pointed our ships to the open sea, hauled up the sails, and left behind the mistrusted Greek lands. We scanned the Gulf of Tarentum, founded by Hercules, if the tale is true. Across the bay in Lacinia rose a temple of Juno, the towers of Calon, and Cilicium with its wreckage of ships. Then, cresting a wave, we sighted far off Trinacrian Aetna, and heard the sound of the moaning sea crashing on rocks and breaking over the speaking shore. The shoals surged high and seethed with sand. Then, Father Anchises, this surely must be Charybdis. These are the crags and dread rocks foretold by Hellenus. Lean on the oars and pull us away, men. They did just that. First Palinurus swung the groaning prow hard to leeward, and the whole crew held us to the left with sail and oar. The ship rode the arcing waves to the sky and sank with them to the depths of hell. Three times the hollowed cliffs roared. Three times we saw spray strike the very stars. With evening the wind died, and the bone tired and lost. We drifted to the Cyclopes' coast. A huge harbor lies there. The water sheltered and still, but Etna thunders nearby with horrific crashes and darkens the sky with swirls of black smoke and glowing ash. Globes of flame rise to lick the sky's dome, and then the mountain wretches up rocks, its own wrenched-out entrails, and whirls molten stone up with a skyward groan, boiling and churning in its innermost depths. The story is told that Enkelados and his body, charred by the thunderbolt, is weighed down under all that mass. Above great Etna, breathes out flame from its ruptured furnace. And when Enceladus turns over, all Trinacria trembles and groans and shrouds the sky with smoke. That night we lay in the woods, enduring endless horrors, and never saw where the sound came from. There were no stars, no light at all in the sky, and misty clouds had buried the moon. Dawn melted away the night's damp shade and rose in a clear sky. At break of day, a strange figure came from the woods, gaunt with hunger, squalid and pitiful. He stretched his hands toward the beach. We stared at him in horror. Filthy, beard-matted clothing fastened with thorns, but in all else a Greek who once had been sent to Troy in his country's arms. When he saw by our clothes and weapons that we were Trojans, he stopped in fear for a moment, then rushed to the shore with tears in his eyes and prayed, By the stars, by the gods above, and by the light we breathe, take me away, Trojans, anywhere at all. That will be enough. I know I'm a Greek who shipped out to Troy. I admit that I fought against the gods of Ilium. If my guilt for that is so great, cut me to pieces and throw me into the sea. At least I will die by human hands. He spoke and then clasped our knees, groveling at our feet. We urged him to tell us who he was, where he was born, and what fate dogged his steps. My father Anchises himself was just a moment's pause, gave the man his hand, encouraging him with this pledge of friendship. At last the man put aside his fear and said to us, I am from Ithaca and served under Ulysses, that unlucky man. My name is Achmenides, and because my father Adamastus was poor, if only I were still a poor man in Greece, I set out for Troy. Here my shipmates left me in Cyclops' cave, forgetting me when they ran from this gruesome entrance, half mad with fear. That cave is a house of gore, dark and huge, and he is gigantic, towering to the stars. Oh, gods, rid earth of this monster. No one could bear to look at or speak to him. He feeds on men's flesh and drinks their black blood. I myself saw him seize two of my friends in his huge hand as he sprawled in his cave and smash them to bits, spattering the rock with their gore. I watched while he chewed their dripping limbs. I saw the warm muscle quiver in his jaws. But he has not gone unpunished. Ulysses did not stand for this. The Ithacan did not forget who he was when the time came. Gorged with his feast and soused with wine, the monster lay stretched on the floor of his cave, with his head bent sideways, belching out gore, wine, and bits of flesh. We prayed to the great ones, drew lots, took our positions, and gouged the huge eye set beneath his frowning brow, like an argive shield or the disk of the sun. We were glad to avenge our dead comrades. Now... Run, you poor fools! Cut your cables from the shore! 
for there are a hundred other Cyclopes here along these curved shores and in the high hills, the same size and shape as Polyphemus. When he pens his sheep in the cave and milks them, the moon has filled her horns with light three times since I began to drag out my life in the woods among the lonely layers of beasts. I watch the Cyclopes from a high rock and tremble at their voices and tramping feet. Berries and wild plums are my sorry fare, roots grubbed from the ground. From my lookout I saw your fleet coming to shore, and now I have surrendered myself, come what may. It is enough to have escaped these savages. Take my life by any death whatever. These words were no sooner out than we saw Polyphemus himself moving his vast bulk down the mountain, a shepherd among his flock, heading down to the shore he knew too well, a hideous monster hulking in his eyeless dark. He used a lopped pine tree as a walking staff, and his fleecy sheep, his only joy and solace, kept him company. When he reached the water, he washed his oozing eye socket out with brine, gritting his teeth and groaning, and then waded through the open sea, the waves barely wetting his towering flanks. We took our worthy suppliant on board and moved fast to get out of there. We cut the cable silently and began to row hard. The cyclops heard and turned toward the sound, but when he couldn't lay hands on us, or match the pace of the Ionian waves, he let out a great roar that shivered the sea. The heartland of Italy shuddered, and Etna bellowed from within its winding caverns. The Cyclopes' tribe was roused and came down from the wooded mountains to fill the shore. We saw them standing helpless, lone eyes glaring, these brothers of Etna, heads reaching the sky, an unnerving conclave. Like aerial oaks on a mountain top, our coniferous cypresses, in a high grove of Jupiter or woods of Diana. We pitched headlong under full sail in whatever direction the wind took us, but Helenus's words rang in my ears, not to steer between Scylla and Charybdis, where the slightest mistake would mean our death. We had decided to sail back when a northerly came blowing down the straits of Pelorus. Our course took me past Pentagia's mouth with, with its living rock, past the bay of Megara, and low-lying Thapsus. Achmenides pointed out these coasts which he had seen before when he sailed as luckless Ulysses' companion. An island lies stretched before a Sicilian bay opposite wave-washed Plemurum, or Tigia in its ancient name. The story is told that the river Alpheus channeled his water under the sea to this very island, mingling his waters with yours, Arethusa. We worshipped as told this land's great gods. Then we passed the loam of Helorus's wetlands, skirted the jutting rocks of Pachinus, and saw far in the distance Camarina, which the fates will not allow to be moved, the Giloan plains and Gela, named after its rushing river. Then steep Acragas, breeder of noble horses, showed off its great walls, and with a tailwind I left you behind, palmettoed Salinas, and grazed Libeum, Lilibeum with its hidden shoals. Then the sad harbor of Drapanum took me in. Here I, who had weathered so many storms at sea, lost my father and Chises, solace of all my cares, best of fathers, rescued from such great perils. In vain you abandoned me in my weary hour. The seer Helenus foretold many horrors, but not this grief, nor did Seleno. This was my final trial, the goal and end of all my long journeys. We left Rapanum, and some god drove me here to your shores. Thus Aeneas, the father of our race, before an audience who hung on every word, told the tale of heaven's dooms and the story of his wanderings. He stopped now and rested.